It's yours. Okay. That's the big one. This will but be we're live. Where we can start so, out. Yeah, we're, we're live. We're oh, we're live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Ring <laughs> Radio. Does Thank that, you so dude. much. You, like, trick us. <laughs> you do that all the time. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. My name is Joshua Lewis. Today I've got Matthew Esquivel and Michael Roundtree. We're discussing the four different views that were very popular during the Protestant Reformation. But before we dive into our discussion today, uh, we want to let you know a little bit about Remnant Radio. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We interview pastors and teachers from different churches and denominations, and we want to help you get outside of your theological echo chamber. So we interview different denominations on purpose. Uh, many of these guys we disagree with, many of these guys we agree with, but our goal is just to, to suspend our presuppositions and study God's word with our Christian brothers from the other side of the theological aisle. So if you're interested in learning about church history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, tune in to Remnant Radio. Make sure to subscribe and like our videos. Uh, before we dive into our discussion today with Matthew Esquivel, I'm going to toss it over to Michael. How are you doing, bro? I am doing good, man. I'm doing good. So uh, excited about this discussion. I was just telling Josh before the show, we've, we've been looking forward to this for weeks. That's right. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, great shows uh, coming down the pike. So uh, as you can see in your screen, uh, there, there's me. I, I'm giving like little quote you're, signs. You're getting there eventually. <laughs> revival culture. And uh, so we're talking about revival culture tomorrow mm. on our To Be Continued Wednesday series. Uh, it, it's it's talking about those Pentecostal charismatic churches that it's like, it's all about revival, revival, revival. we got to get revival and revival is going to solve the problems. And, uh, and it can be exhausting. And so a lot of people good reach too. out to, but it there's can good, be, there's, keeps you out of complacency. It says good, bad, and ugly. So good, there's, there's different, ugly. there's different, there's a couple of them. <laughs> bad okay. and ugly. So okay. one third of it is good. Yeah. Roughly 33.3% of it is good. So, um, <laughs> revival culture tomorrow. Uh, we're talking about theonomy next week and just war theory. That's an exciting wow. conversation with Doug Wilson. He's going to be back on the show. Uh, John Cooper just spoke with his assistant today. Uh, if you've ever listened to, like, I mean, if you ever listened to Christian music, you've probably heard Skillet before. He's the lead singer for it. Uh, healthy charismatic culture, cessation of the gifts with Dr. Tom Schreiner back. We're also going to talk about LGBTQ coming up. So definitely make sure you hit that subscribe button mm -hmm. so that you get dinged when we have one of these episodes. And this ministry isn't free. So if you would consider uh, donating to us, we have a couple of ways you can do that. You can do that through PayPal. That's for a one-time donation or Patreon. And on Patreon, uh, it's just a, a monthly donation for as little as $5. You get access to extra stuff. And uh, speaking of extra stuff, you got... Oh, yeah. Yeah, Michael well, Miller's I'd first like to say, demystifying the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'll explain that. But first, I would like to say he is not Josh Lewis. I just fat fingered the wrong button. Uh, anyway, that's that's Michael, the, the lower third that y'all just saw come out. That, <laughs> anyway, that's confusing. Uh, demystifying the gifts of the Spirit was a series that we came out with, I want to say two years ago, me and Michael Miller uh, put together a program together. Uh, we sold it on the website as a way to kind of fundraise for the ministry. Uh, but now uh, uh, we have decided that we're going to release that entire series on Patreon. So awesome. uh, as low as five bucks a month, you get total access to all that stuff, but it just helps us uh, produce our content. But as always, with all of our stuff on Patreon, if you're out there and you're like, hey, I can't afford it, but I'd love to see this video or that video, uh, I'll send it to you. Just send me an email at media at theremnantradio.com and uh, we can get that stuff to you. Otherwise, uh, check those out. They're going to be really, really cool. Uh, so it's basically a six or... Yeah, it's a six-part series specifically on the gifts of the Spirit. So it'll be... It's a sixer, dude. It's a sixer, man. It's... Uh, without further ado... Esquivel. Esquivel. Hello. Matthew, How are you, sir? Esquivel. Man? I'm doing well. Yeah? Yeah. This guy up. is the man. He is getting PhD in church history, writing dissertations, bro. Making babies. Making babies. Got a five-month-old baby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is awesome. So. I'm excited to see her. So we're talking about the four views of communion kind of coming out of the Protestant Reformation. So right. um, you know what? Introduce us to yourself and then tell us about those four views. Okay. Well, I'm Matthew Esquivel. I'm a associate pastor at Storehouse Dallas, Dallas House of Prayer. We're located in North Dallas, Farmers Branch area. And um, I'm also a director of our Encounter Jesus School, which is our discipleship program. Uh, and so I am also getting a PhD. So that's really my full-time gig, um, PhD, and then uh, and then um, also pastoring. But um, I'm excited to talk to you guys today. How did you find coming. time for us, man? <laughs> <laughs> Made it happen. <laughs> okay. So four views of communion. Now to a right. lot of Protestants, they're 
they're like, wait, what? Four? I thought it was either it becomes Christ's body or it's just a symbol. But you're telling us there's four. There's four. There's more. And really, one of them is not Protestant, and it's the main one that the Protestants are reacting to um, mm -hmm. during this time. So shall I just... Start with the in? Romans. Okay. <laughs> First, I want to start with what we're talking about here. We've got a little, I've got a little visual demonstration here. Yes. So you, this is... That must have been a very large plastic cup that you pulled the cellophane off of to get to that. Gosh. I was <laughs> fighting one of those things yesterday at church. <laughs> it was, or Sunday, it was embarrassing. But um, anyway, <laughs> this is a piece of unleavened bread. And of course, the cup that has bona fide grape juice. I think it's even Welch's, which the Methodists okay. are, are, uh, are, are Good old Sam. But it is behind. grape juice. Yes, it is. <laughs> is that the fifth view of communion? Sorry, we're not going <laughs> to... <laughs> You asked, not me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. the Roman Catholics. That okay, right okay. Sure. So let's talk about four main views okay. that were happening during the Protestant Reformation, during the 16th century. Um, this was, first of all, I want to say Protestant Reformation, we usually think about that as a, a, a debate within the Western European Church about the doctrine of justification. And you have the Protestant... Um, 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 not mantra, but slogan of, of justification by faith alone. And that's often seen as the primary uh, uh, um, point of contention when it came to the Protestants and the Catholics. And it, and it truly was. However, um, one actually might argue that more contentious, more contentious was the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, of the Holy Communion, of the Eucharist. And the reason I say that is because um, all the Protestants agreed on one thing. They didn't like the Roman Catholic view. Um, however, within the different Protestant communities, they were deeply divided on these issues. There was uh, a colloquy called the Marburg Quali Colloquy, where Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, a Swiss reformer, and a number of others are involved in this conference on trying to come to some points of agreement of doctrine um, in response to uh, what they saw as abuses in the Roman Catholic Church, both in doctrine and practice. Um, I think there were 14 major points uh, dealt with at this colloquy, and the only one that they did not agree on is the Lord's Supper and the Eucharist. Um, Zwingli is weeping at the end of this meeting, broken over the disunity that is occurring between him and Martin Luther. And Martin Luther is so adamantly against Zwingli's view, um, which we'll discuss, but um, that he. It just comes to no point of agreement whatsoever. Did he issue mm -hmm. like a painting that shamed Zwingli like he does he, all of his other and opponents? He wrote on the table, <laughs> carved into the table, hook est corpum meum. This is my body. In and the table? In the Did table. He, the table? <laughs> he didn't eat okay, the table. He wrote, he, this was, it, that'll make sense as I uh, okay, explain okay. each one of their views. Um, but Luther said, you need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit for revelation on this because you have it wrong. Um, and then, of course, Wingley and his friends tell Luther and his buddies, mm -hmm. please do the same, you know. Sure. Um, so anyway, this is this, this, so justification by faith alone was a point of unity amongst the Protestant uh, reformers. But the Eucharist was the most divisive issue um, amongst the reformers themselves. So. Um, so what are those views? Uh, we're talking about four today. You've got the Roman Catholic view, the view of a man named Ulrich, Ulrich Zwingli. I'm not Swiss or German, but um, he's, uh, he was a Swiss reformer. Uh, and then you have our, you know, everyone familiar with Martin Luther here um, and Lutherans in Germany. And then John Calvin, um, another Swiss reformer. Um, and each of these had their own uh, unique take on um, on the Eucharist. And just uh, and I use the word Eucharist. Um, I grew up Episcopal Anglican. I'm in the Pentecostal charismatic world now. I identify as a charismatic, but I still keep saying Eucharist because that's kind of what's been ingrained into me my whole life. But the it's Eucharist, I like the it. Lord's Supper, <laughs> yeah. um, the Holy Communion, all synonymous. Eucharist is Greek for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, 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 early in the church, they referred to it as the sacrifice of Thanksgiving. Um, but the basic scriptures that each of these 
different views are trying to make sense of. Um, John chapter 6, kind of around 48 through 50, but a lot of John 6, where Jesus is, is makes the, 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 the cannibal statement, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have eternal life. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, Jesus is really... I mean, he lost a lot of followers in that, um, almost lost his own, and boldly told his disciples, does this offend you that I said this? What about when you see the Son of Man ascended at the right hand of the Father? I mean, Jesus was not afraid to lose people over the statements that he made. So what does he mean by that, though, is what we're wrestling out here in these four views. Uh, Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, the gospel narratives of Jesus at the Lord's Supper, saying, taking bread and the cup, and when he takes the bread, he says, this is my body, which is given for you. Whenever you eat it, do this. And remember to me, he takes the cup, and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Um, Different versions, depending on what gospel account you're taking. So, But what does he mean when he says, this is my body? Does he literally mean that? Is he... Speaking symbolically, that's what they're going to wrestle out. And then 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four is a key passage. Paul talks about, he says, the, the bread that we bless, is it not a communion or a partaking or a sharing in the body of Christ? And the cup which we bless, is it not a partaking, a communion, a participation or sharing in the blood of Christ? Um, so you have... Um, and... What you see in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 as well is you see a uh, Paul comparing three things. He's got the Lord's Supper on one hand, that's what he's talking about, but he's, he's speaking in terms of the sacrifices of Israel at the altar in the temple and the pagan sacrifices of the Gentiles. Um, so all of those three things are happening in the same conversation. Um, and so those, those raise a few questions for the early church and for the reformers in the 16th century. Um, and so I'll kind of, I'll give us those questions, kind of break down how each one answers those. Um, first of all, uh, we talk about the Lord's Supper as a sacrament. Yeah. So the, the basic question we're going to have here is for each of these different views, what is a sacrament according to these different views? Secondly, um, in what sense is, is Jesus Christ present in this sacrament? You know, he says, this is my body, this is my blood. Um, what do we, what do we make of that? In what sense is the bread and wine a figure or symbol in the sacrament? Um, all sides agree that the bread and wine are figures and symbols in some way, but they'll all understand and unpack that differently. And then finally, um, in what sense is grace imparted to the faithful, to believers, when they receive the sacrament? Um, what's the nature of that grace, and what, how, how is, is it, or how is it conferred in the sacraments? And there's really a fifth one that's uh, most pertinent, especially to the Roman Catholic views. What, in light of Paul talking about the Lord's Supper in the context of Israel sacrifices and pagan sacrifices, um, the question is, are we to understand the Lord's Supper as a sacrifice? Um, so, mm-hmm. let's break it down. Okay. Any, any comments so or things we, can we need to... we go through this in a number of ways. <laughs> okay. We can start with... View number one, Roman Catholic, and answer all those questions, and then the next one, and then answer all those questions. Or we can take each question and then contrast. So, right, 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 right. However you please. Okay. Walk I, us through. I think I'll just take the Roman Catholic view and do Great, all those first and just, and just take it down from there. Cool. And then we'll pull questions out. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So Roman Catholic view. This is articulated most clearly in the Fourth Lateran Council in the 13th century, 1215. It was a council in the West that met to deal with some heresies going on in the church of the time, but also to deal on um, issues of ecclesiastical abuse and discipline and things like that. Um, But within that, they talk about um, um, the, their theology of the, of the Lord's Supper. And that is really the marking point for, that sets the tone for late medieval, early modern Roman Catholic theology of the Eucharist. It will be reiterated in response to the reformers at the Council of Trent in the 16th century. Um, so how did the Roman Catholics answer these questions? What is a sacrament? Well, according to Fourth Lateran Council, according to Council of Trent, um, and I'm paraphrasing a lot here, but trying to get the main ideas, is that they want to say that a sacrament, um, which uh, it's a visible sign of an invisible thing. 
So you've got something visible in front of you that you can see, in this case, bread and wine, but there's an invisible thing that this is signifying. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more than that in the Roman Catholic view. Um, the Roman Catholic view is that this sign, these figures of bread and wine, that they affect the very thing that they represent, that they signify. Um, so not only when, when the faithful receive the Lord's Supper, um, they receive the thing that it's signifying, which is the body and blood of Christ. So in the sacrament of the Eucharist, you've got bread and wine are the figures. You've, those are the visible things. But the invisible realities, the invisible things, are the body and blood of Christ. Um, how, though, is Jesus Christ present? In what sense is this actually, or is it not, his body and blood? Um, for the Roman Catholic view, Christ is present in this sacrament of the Lord's Supper corporally. Jesus' body is here in the sacrament. Um, and it's corporally present by transubstantiation. We'll break that term down. Um, the Catholic teaching of transubstantiation in a sentence says, after the priest takes the bread and takes the cup, lifts it up, recites the words of institution that Christ stated the in the Gospels. Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's actually where we get that term. Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> um, that at that moment, by divine power, the bread and wine transform completely into the body and blood of Christ, such that um, Christ is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, mm -hmm. by divine power. Now, what's with this word transubstantiation? Well, we've got the word trans and substance, <laughs> kind of mixed into one word here, um, it, which literally means a change of substance. Um, now, the, this word substance, it's from Aristotle's categories of, 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 of essence and being. And so you have, um, for Aristotle, you have substance, um, the, the, the underlying reality, the what a thing is. Um, we have uh, this, for Roman Catholics, it would be an, uncon an unconsecrated host <laughs> or unconsecrated um, element that the substance of this is bread. What it is in its basic reality is bread. Um, and, um, and it's distinguished from what's called accidents. Accidents are qualities or properties of the bread. The bread is flat. The bread is white with brown burn marks. It has holes in it, if you can see that. Um, it, is, it has a certain taste and touch and smell. Those are the accidents. In the Roman Catholic view, after the priest consecrates the bread and the cup, the, the accidents remain the same, so they still look like bread, they still look like wine, they taste like bread, they smell like bread, they taste like wine, um, in this case grape juice, um, but, um, but what they are is the body and blood of Christ, wholly transformed completely 100%. It's not half bread. And half body, it's 100% body, no bread. Looks like bread, smells like bread, tastes like bread. But by divine power at that consecration, it has been transformed into the substance of Christ's body and blood, such that his body is present fully, 100%. His blood is present, his soul is present, and his divinity is present. Um, that's what's going on. Um, now, why doesn't it change? Why doesn't why doesn't the appearance change? Um, well, the Roman Catholic view for centuries had been, well, if Jesus had put the appearance of his human flesh and blood in here, we would all pass out and be horrified and we wouldn't want to eat it. And so it's very pastoral. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's like, that is true. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's the, and and I, I don't know that I've ever said this on the show before. Uh -huh. But I would agree with the Catholics on this. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's the yeah. it's the account of horror argument. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> it's just like uh, to prevent horror um, from the uh, recipients. So to to kind of break this down a little bit too, I used I grew up liking X Men. Um, so you had shapeshifter Mystique, you know, okay. in there. She changed into people. You know, she's um, 
Uh, uh, and so she looks, she's blue. Like that's what she normally looks like, but she could change into Josh, you know, um, she could change into Wolverine. She does that in the movie. She looks like Wolverine. She smells like Wolverine. She can even talk like Wolverine. So her accidents have changed, but her substance, her mysticness, who she actually is and what she is, her underlying reality is actually still mystique. Okay. Um, the opposite is happening here. <laughs> the appearances are remaining, but the substance, the underlying reality, is changing, is changing completely, wholly, hundred yeah. percent, and in not um, in a, and in not in a spiritual way, right? So in, like so so if it Western mind mm-hmm. right now comes to even this idea, it's such a it's such a massive assault on Western thinking. Oh right? yeah, like yep. uh, are, are you suggesting that we just practiced? alchemy like that that this this thing physically changed right and and they're and they're gonna say yes Mm -hmm. right and then you're gonna say so it's not spiritual and they're gonna say well yeah it's spiritual but it's physical too like like uh the the western mind is highly highly offended by this idea yes yes hate it (laughs) yeah so 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 is the and i know we're gonna get to the Mm -hmm. protestant view here in a second is the protestant view fueled by post-enlightenment thinking or is the the Protestant view an actual biblical, scriptural, exegetical like this cannot be the case? Right, right. And I know that we you can't have dive too in, deep into that. Right, right. We'll we'll hit on that as we go into the reformers. I think you have multiple things to play. I think you have a a, a it's it offends reason. Um, for some, it will offend what they understand to be the plain sense of scripture. Um, that's the most common theological argument from the reformers and from a scriptural standpoint that this, this is, this defies the plain sense of scripture. Um, it is a philosophical, philosophical view. It is, um, the Roman Catholics are applying a, uh, an Aristotelian metaphysic, um, to find language and categories for what scripture is saying on their account, uh, how they're interpreting scripture. Um, most of the Protestant reformers are adopting a post or an enlightenment, post enlightenment, Metaphysic, which um, um, uh, basically says something cannot be a, a one object or one person cannot be in more than one place at one time. Um, so Christ's body is in heaven. It's seated at the right hand. And so, I mean, a lot of Protestant reformers are going to say, look, the scripture and the creeds tell us plainly that Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. <laughs> he can't be here at the at, at the Lord's table. His body's up there. and and But it's... And Christ's body cannot be in one more than one place at, at one time. And the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox are just like, your your metaphysical imagination has just gone kaput since the Alignment. <laughs> I mean, um, ancient philosophy has always believed that in some way, especially when we're talking about God here, <laughs> that God can in some way be corporally present. Jesus um, can be corporally present wherever he wants to be in as many places as he wants to be because he's not only human, he's divine. So that will be the Roman Catholic response. So you you've got a mix there. You've got a you've it's um and you've got an authority thing. I mean, this is dogma for the Catholic Church. This is you have to believe this if you're gonna be Is it dogma for Roman. Eastern Orthodox? They it as far as the real presence, um they are not as tied dogmatically to the term transubstantiation. Okay. You will find that language in different writings, maybe in different creeds and formulas, but it's it's for them, if it's not spelled out in the seven ecumenical councils, we're just going to attribute it to mystery. We do believe that Christ's very body and blood is present in this sacrament, but they are not transubstantiation. Is they're not? They're going to leave it a mystery. They're going to leave it a mystery. So but, leave it to the Eastern Orthodox. Fair, Protestants. There are some Protestants who view it that way too. That's true. Which we'll right. get to. Right. 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 Um, okay. But let's keep let's keep working through. I think your next question. Mm. We've got the question of in what sense is it a symbol? Is that the next question? Yes. Yes. So um, for Roman Catholics, how is this bread and this wine? Is it a figure or symbol? Um, before the consecration, it is true bread and true wine. Um, but after the consecration, after the priest lifts it up and recites the words of institution. Um, it's the figures of bread and wine. It's the, uh, and, and they'll, they'll use the words, it's the appearances or accidents of bread and wine. So in that sense, it's a symbol. It's something visibly that's bread and wine, but invisibly, it truly is the body and blood of Christ. Um, and for the Roman Catholics, this, it, it affects grace. It affects the things that it signifies, that we truly receive of the body and blood of Christ. We receive, they'll use the term spiritual food, 
They'll use the term, it will nourish us body and soul with the body and blood of Christ, with the life of Christ, the forgiveness of sins. I mean, it's, it's there's, actually that Catholic catechism has eight different <laughs> benefits that are received. Um, and it is the sacrament of unity. It actually affects unity in the body of Christ when it's received. Um, now, another key issue here for the Roman Catholic view um, is that because... Christ's body and blood for the Roman Catholics is truly present on the altar, true body, true blood, soul, and divinity, that the act of the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice. Um, and that is something that the Protestant reformers will vehemently deny um, as well. Um, but it's a sacrifice in the sense that it is not an additional sacrifice to the one Christ made, the Roman Catholic the Council of Trent will respond to these objections, is that it's one and the same sacrifice of Christ on the cross, but it's re-presented to us. It's presented to us again in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So it's kind of like a time warp going right. on here. So mm -hmm. is there a sense to the Roman Catholics in which it is propitiatory? Yes, so, it is a propitiatory uh, sacrifice. The priest is presenting this sacrifice for the sake of the people, yes. essentially so they can stay saved. To re-sacrificing to expiate again. sins, to yeah. to re, to bring remission or removal of temporal sins. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a you won't go to heaven to this, but it 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 can affect the amount of time you spend in purgatory. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it it is a sacri it is a it's a propitiatory sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that benefits the faithful in removing and and, and remitting sin and appeasing um, God's righteous judgment against our sin, um, and such that even the departed believers benefit from this. So you'll have, you'll, and this was one of the biggest abuses for Martin Luther, is all these masses for the dead. You could do private masses and, and offer these, the mass in a way that would benefit the soul of your departed relative in purgatory. And um, the Reformers had a lot of issues with that. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so okay. um, we and, love the Reformation, <laughs> and that's going to be one of those points that I know we're we're already twenty eight minutes. Right, right. We, first we set one, the we set the set, set the yeah, tone yeah, yeah. though, because that's Everything really else will be easier. To be responses yeah. to. Okay, mm -hmm. so so my question is going to be like on that point. I've heard a lot of mischaracterizations of that too. Okay, and, and or Roman Catholics saying that's not what we believe. We don't believe we're sacrificing Jesus again. Mm -hmm. We don't believe we're crucifying yeah. him again. And I want to mm -hmm. say that the one of the primary things that I read during the Protestant Reformation is like that was the one of the biggest deal, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, his incarnation into the and I want to say incarnation is probably not the right word, but his he, this is physically his body, this is physically his blood, mm -hmm. and you're crucifying him again, right? Right? Like we got a Bible verse on that one, like right? He, he, he was crucified once, once right? Like, right? Right? You don't yeah, want to yeah, crucify yeah. We, the son. We, we got no need, we got no need to crucify him again. Right? Right? right. That was like one of the big contentious points. And I don't know if Vatican II clears this up or or what the whole. And I I'm not going to ask you to be no, knowing no, 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 the, no. the whole Council of Roman Catholic Faith. No, 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 no. no. Be... I'm familiar more with okay. Trent than which responded directly to that okay. objection. So he the the biggest uh, objection by the Protestant reformers, Hebrews nine, Hebrews ten, that um, one sacrifice, the one sacrifice for all time, has perfected those who are being sanctified. Yeah. And so that is, uh, you'll see it in every Protestant creed, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. is that verse cited. Yeah. Um, the Roman Catholic response to that is, we are not repeating the sacrifice of Christ. We are re-presenting one and the same sacrifice. This is the unbloody sacrifice. Re it's a re-presentation. It's putting before us again the bloody sacrifice of Christ. On the so, so like mm -hmm. Galatians... I preach the gospel to you. I forget how he says it in Galatians. I don't have my uh, Bible. It's yeah, my I think Philippians will say I'm I'm filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Well, is that well, what you're thinking? No, in Galatians, he says, um, uh, before your eyes, Christ was crucified. The way he says it. Okay. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I do. I'm not familiar but, with that. My, the uh, one I Bible actually, verse you didn't memorize? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come I, on, Roundtree. I just threw out the words. I've never paused on that wording right there and really thought twice about it, honestly. Yeah, I mean, the Galatian church wasn't present, at least potentially wasn't present. Maybe a few of them were, but like before right. your eyes. It seems as if he's making the illustration that like um, the gospel is preached so clearly to you that it was like... That he was represented. That right. was represented. And it's, it's, it's actually very similar and akin to the Jewish Passover. In the sense that when at Passover, which we just passed that season on the Jewish calendar, that 
um, there's a sense of that that present, the Passover celebrated in 2021, there is a some sort of deep connection to the original first Passover that happened. Such that they, it's you see this in the language of the liturgy of most of most Passover seder's. It's uh, Passover meals that the Lord brought us out of Egypt. The Lord, you know, defeated our enemies. There's a deep identification with that. So there's there's a similarity and affinity there, and that's actually what you'll see modern Roman Catholic yeah, responses okay. to. And one more mm-hmm. on this representation. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, I've read that in a Methodist. I can't remember what it was, but some sort mm-hmm. of Methodist um, something or other that. Uh, a Methodist church use that wording that uh-huh. we're representing, and uh, you're smiling. So, are you familiar with this? This came up in class today. So we're in in class. We're talking about John there. Wesley and Methodism. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, right <laughs> um, in a body or out of body, we don't know. But um, so it came up in class, and um, Wesley, because John Wesley is from the Anglican Church, which has a much a view closer to the Catholic Church than a lot of the other Protestant um, reformers will. Um, so Wesley seems to make room for a sense that, that he, he he definitely affirms that something's happening here. Anyway, um, what came up in class today is that there is with more recent updates to the Methodist books of worship. Um, there, this this came up as as one of a Methodist class member said. Our our book of worship says, "Let this be for us the body and blood of Christ." How is that not transubstantiation? <laughs> um, and that language of representation and sacrifice has actually um, and and one student recently graduated and wrote his dissertation on that. I'm not as familiar with how that language is present in current Methodist liturgy, but my understanding is that language has moved in some ways more towards that. R- sense of representing Christ um, in a sense that makes it sound like a sacrifice is going on. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's dive into the other views because okay. I want to make sure we cover them. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, and that helps give us context because everyone else is responding to that. So next view I want to talk about is Ulrich Zwingli. Um, this is the most radically different view of the Lord's Supper from Roman Catholicism that you could possibly imagine. <laughs> um, what is a sacrament for Zwingli? And they're memorials. They're signs um, and they're public testimonies of a grace already given. So for Zwingli, um, every sacrament, baptism, Eucharist, or those are the only two. <laughs> for him, uh, Roman Catholics had seven, but um, Zwingli, uh, all the Reformers cut it down to two. Um, for Zwingli, uh, both baptism and the Eucharist, it's, it's, there's not any grace being imparted here. There, there's not any, it, it, it's, a, it's completely memorial. It's to remind us of the one sacrifice of Christ on the cross. So mm-hmm. wedding ring, symbol Redding, of a marriage. Yes, yes. So for Zwingli— but It doesn't make you married or— Yeah, if I take exactly. it off, I'm not unmarried, I put it on. It's not doing anything. It's symbolized it's what symbol. happened. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, which is, and there's a little more to it there. Which but, is, but mm-hmm. really, the Zwinglian view is the view of pretty much evangelicals in America. Most American evangelicals will hold a Zwinglian memorial view. Yeah, toss out an arbitrary but, number. But in church 80%. history, pre-Zwingli, right. how many memorial views were there about, uh, or of, of the sacraments? I would argue none. You had one guy named Berengar in the um, ninth century that was arguing for a figure representation view. What he meant by that, I'm not totally clear. And I think he might have still, in some sense, a firm presence. But he is definitely against this notion he, that Christ is corporally he present. He was So, right. And so, <laughs> and actually, there was a whole document that the Roman Church made that made him recant twice. <laughs> and the language about Christ's presence became stronger as a result of his opposition. And so you have Zwingli and others renouncing that very document. Yeah. Well, I just bring it up because, you, you know, when I when I got saved and I started, you know, communion, baptism, I got baptized mm-hmm. and all this, like Zwingli's view was the only view ever presented. Right. It uh, usually is. And mm-hmm. it wasn't until I realized that, you know what, a hundred percent of church history didn't have this view. Right. Maybe I should think about it differently. And I only thought it's either Zwing- Zwingli or it's Roman Catholic. Right. So that's yeah. why I mentioned right. it. We should always right. remember or that popular Christianity 
is not biblical, and biblical Christianity mm-hmm. is not popular. And that should always there, help us. Now there can be some overlap. I'm just kidding, guys. Let's, uh, I'm just kidding. Settle yeah. down. Settle so, down. So Zwingli, how is Christ's body and blood present in the Lord's Supper? It's not. It's not there. Christ is in heaven, seated at the Father's right hand. He can't be in more than one place at one time. Again, he's adopting a Newtonian metaphysics, um, uh, phys- physics. I mean, take the meta out of it completely, basically. Um, so Christ's body is in heaven. Christ is present in the sacrament through the contemplation of faith. So in a sense, we can say Christ is present because when I look at this bread, I drink this cup, I remember that Jesus sat before his 12 disciples on the night that he was handed over to be crucified and gave them this bread and this cup and said, this is my body, this is my blood. Um, so we remember that, and through that contemplation of faith, Christ is present through the memory that we have of Christ. Um, the bread and wine, they're symbols and figures of signs of Christ's body and blood, but in no sense are they the true body and blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. Um and for Zwingli, no grace is conferred in the sacrament at all. Um, you don't receive any strengthening or impartation of grace um, as you receive this. It's purely memorial, um, and it may evoke love and faith and hope in the sense that you remember who Jesus is. And it's definitely, for Zwingli, not a sacrifice. Um, so that's the Zwingli in view. Okay. Okay? Luther. Luther has a—this is— it gets a little interesting with with uh, okay. Luther and Calvin here. So Luther's uh, view, um, how does he view? Well, let, let's would it, say, be, would it be fair the, to the say sacramental union? Would it be fair to say that Zwingli is naturalistic when coming to communion? Uh, say what you mean by that term. So naturalistic, mm-hmm. as in there's nothing spiritual happening whatsoever. Like when you talk about Christ think, being present in our memory, Christ. None no, of that. he would say that we're that we're spiritually fed. Okay, like that there is a there's something spiritual going on, but that that God there there's such a division between spirit and matter for Zwingli, such that the like, God doesn't need and doesn't use and would be almost blasphemous for him to use. Uh, he may not use that strong a language, but that God doesn't use matter to communicate spiritual things to us. Right. Um, so so. In Zwingli's view, mm-hmm. uh, how would he say? What would he say is the difference between somebody in church participating in communion um, and reflecting upon Christ's sacrifice versus somebody emoting to Jesus over a worship song about his sacrifice? They're both remembering his sacrifice, right? Um, they're both remembering. It might even be a song about the body and the blood. Mm-hmm. Um, What's different to Zwingli, if anything, or are they pretty much the same? And it's just Jesus told us to do that one. That, that's that's the biggest difference is you've got um, the Jesus Christ has commanded to us to do this. I, it's, I uh, sounded pejorative in that. I was, I'm just trying to present like what is like when we get down to it, what's the difference? Right, right. I think for Zwing, Zwingli would say this is still a very important thing to do. Christ did this. He definitely you would see it reduce the amount of times it was taken reduced significantly in his reformed churches and then um and we see that today as well so um, about, right 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 I, and 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 the, a lot of the thought behind that was just we do this way too much i mean we're doing it daily multiple times a day there's private masses all over the place you know if you're rich and you need to get your dead loved one out of purgatory you just write the check and you've got 20 private masses said for him this right. month and zwingli says that this the outrageous number of masses, Lord's Supper that is being performed is giving us the wrong idea. So we're going to cut back significantly. Okay. Um, and that's been that's been my context. I don't know mm-hmm. if it's been Michael's, but mm-hmm. that that when it was just a symbol, we can do it. I mean, once every six months. Right, right, right. Once every four months. Once a quarter. It's, it was a popular thing right, in right, the churches right. I grew up in. Right. Um, and if there was something more important, like, like. I'm trying to think of something, you know, like VBS, it would get pushed back further, right? So so we we have this Sad. thing that Christ yeah. has told us to yeah. do. Well, I'm just saying like there's yeah. an actual application to this theology. Exactly. But I think and there is, are consequences. That are that's mm-hmm. a consequence. Mm-hmm. And I think that's mm-hmm. a that's a fair way of right. saying it. Um again, I, I understand people who hold a Zwinglian view, and I don't want this episode to be like hundred percent anti Zwinglian, but mm-hmm. I, I do think it actually affects our practice. And yes. Everywhere I go, that Zwinglian theology of communion is um the sacraments are not right right yeah 
Absolutely. And you've got church history. And and I just want to ask you this. Absolutely. When you see Luke's phrase, the breaking of bread, mm-hmm. do you understand that is they're just hanging out and sharing a meal? Or do you understand that as communion? Because Acts, it says they devoted themselves to the, the breaking of bread, apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I think that is a reference to the Lord's Supper. Okay. So so because mm-hmm. that is that's how I view it too. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you do like a search on on that, it, mm-hmm. it appears to be the case. And it also seems to make the most sense of like um, they're, they're just, it already said they're devoted to fellowship. Right. If all he meant was they were sharing a meal, it would seem very strange for him to separate that. Exactly. And, you know, as a pastor, one day I'm just like, oh, man, to be devoted to communion and we, and my church right. does it once a month, you right. know, and, and, and if a sermon or if, uh, and if it doesn't work out, we might go five or six weeks. And I'm like, and then I saw the evidence of church history and, and it was just, uh, I think it's hard to hold this wingly in view. So uh, I do want to be fair too, because my argument is, um, if I'm going to be intellectually honest, my argument that we won't practice this if we hold this view is merely uh, circumstantial. Uh, there, there certainly are Zwinglians out there that take it every week. I'm sure that there are. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it's certainly experiential, you know. So it's it's probably at best uh, a, a shallow argument. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I would say that I think. I think I can say confidently that it is the case. I, you know, I've, I've got people in here like, man, like I liked Zwingli. Like Zwingli's my guy, and I get that. Dawson, and I respect Zwingli's that. a good I theologian. Yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> Dawson's I don't wanna, in there defending him. Yeah, I know, cool. I know. And, and, I, and I, I get Dawson. that. Right. Um, I, I don't want again to say like, hey, because we don't practice it, therefore, you know, the result is bad. You know, there are charismatic chaos that happens. That doesn't mean that we believe that the charismatic gifts should be practiced, right? right. right? So just because the outcome is bad, doesn't mean that the doctrine is. It could just be the practice is bad, right? right? So we we want to make sure that we're we're taking this with intellectual honesty here. So I want to kind of back myself up and police myself a little bit. Um, But that has been my experience. And I think anytime that someone's been hurt by something like that, It come it comes out a little salty, so I got to please myself a little bit. Uh, okay, let's get to Luther. We, okay. we really need to get to Luther. Luther. Okay, I'll go through him more quickly too. Um, for Luther, a sacrament it's what is it? It's a testament and a sign. So you've got a promise, you've got the word that's delivered, and then you have the sign, the visible thing in front of you. Um, so for in this case, the promise or the testament in the Lord's Supper for Luther is this is my body, this is my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. The, the sacrament or the sign is the bread and the cup. Um, and, um, and we have, and through the sacrament, we have access by faith to that promise. Um, so how is Christ present um, for Luther? Christ is corporally present. His body and blood is present under bread and wine. Which that's going to be a surprise to some people <laughs> yeah. who only think in terms of Zwingli and Roman exactly. Catholic. Yeah. Luther believed it did be. Luther, become-ish, the body and the it, blood. It, became, it did, and, and that's what he uses in, with, because, and he uses, if you look at kind of his own theological writings on this, you have this, he uses the language of under, in, um, within, uh-huh. the it, within the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ is in, within, or under the bread and wine, um, or where it is. Um, but he also uses the language of is. So three three things, I think, Luther would have, would uh, I know he affirms um, is that uh, um, is that <laughs> it's in the Babylonian captivity of the Catholic Church, um, but uh, in his uh, writing on it said so this is true bread and true wine. Luther would say that's the first point. Second point, the body and blood of Christ are in or under this true bread and true wine. Third thing he would say, this true bread and true wine is the true body and the true blood of Christ. So we got both things going on. Um, so, so what does it mean that it both is, and it's kind of not because it's all around it, but not quite it? Right. <laughs> exactly. He will use the language of sacramental union mm-hmm. that God has has um, in a in has that this, he he talks about different types of union. You've got the union of there's water in this cup, such that but I call it water, you know, or in this bottle. Um, there's a union of marriage. There's a husband and a wife. They're one flesh. Um, But then there's a sacramental union where God, um, by his divine power, unites something, an invisible reality to a visible reality. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's what it's it's um, like the God man is his example, right? Yes. And that's the highest form of union, the hypostatic union Mm -hmm. and which is occurs only in Christ, the person of Jesus Mm -hmm. Christ, the humanity and divinity of Christ is hypostatically united such as they're inseparable and such that it's one person. 
um, for a sacramental union, you still actually have bread and wine on one hand and body and blood on the other in the same place at the same time. And is this sometimes called consub? No, consubstantiation. No, it is. And okay, because I was going to ask because yeah. you've got Anglicans, mm -hmm. and I think they use the term. They don't use the term sacramental union. I don't think. Not that I'm aware of. But yeah. they do mm -hmm. use the term consubstantiation. Is that correct? No, no. no this is okay. actually nobody really likes to like subscribe to that term. Um, it's it's a term that is a that. People will say Luther holds a constant substantiation uh -huh. view. You talk to a Lutheran, especially a Lutheran pastor, they'll mm -hmm. say no. It's we we yeah <laughs> we we said, we said nobody does. They they just don't want the Aristotelian category of substance at all. Yeah, yeah. They just want to say here's what Scripture says. Jesus says this is my body. This is my blood. And that's why Luther at this Marburg colloqu colloquy when Zwingli said this is not Christ's body and blood, Luther carves into the wooden table in Latin this. <laughs> is my body <laughs> and leaves the room. <laughs> so that's just how intense Luther is about things. It's called that I'll a knife drop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of wood is this? Not the Michael. If you say so, something I don't like, bro, so, bro this, is, this is a nice table. So Luther wants to, he says the scripture calls it body and blood, but it also calls it bread and cup. I mean, 1 Corinthians 11 is not the, the bread which we bless a communion of the body of Christ and the cup, a communion of the blood of Christ. So he's like, look, in the Bible, it's called bread and it's called body. It's called cup and it's called blood. So I'm going to do the same thing. And that's basically the, the the Lutheran view of it. Now, Luther, I mean, there's a story of, I mean, there was, the, the chalice was, the, the cup was spilled. The consecrated cup was spilled. And I mean, he freaked out and was like trying to, uh, uh, spilled on a lady's dress and on the chair. He had the chair um, upholstered and burned the lady's stress. I mean, it's was this was a, a detriment to the body and blood of Christ to him for this chalice to spill on a lady's dress and on a piece of furniture. Um, so he's serious about it. Um, but for Luther, it is not a sacrifice by any means. Um, he says, and if we call this a sacrifice, then we're saying that we're saved by works, that our remission or forgiveness of sins happens through works, um, by performing human work. No, it's a promise that we receive assurance of when we take the sacrament. That's Luther's view. Mm -hmm. Calvin. Um, he kind of had, has a middle view between the Lutherans and the Zwinglians. He doesn't want to go with Zwingli and say it's purely memorial. Just a symbol. Just a symbol. And he doesn't want to go with Luther and say this is truly Christ's body and blood present. Um, he affirms a, a type of, of, of spiritual presence. So for, for him, he'll say a sacrament's a visible sign of an invisible thing. He quotes St. Augustine, I have right here. Um, mm -hmm. And they're signs and seals of the covenant. Um, so this visible sign, it puts before us the invisible thing. So even though it's, it's actual, it's truly bread and wine or juice in front of me, um, it is still putting before me the true body and blood of Christ in a spiritual manner. So up until Luther's mm -hmm. day, because you, you, that's a, it's an important thing. Mm -hmm. I know this is sidetrack. No. But wine all the way up until Luther. Wine all the way. All the way up until all Methodist? All the way up to the 1800s prohibition, right? Sam Welchus? Mr. Welch? All the way to, to Methodists that I'm aware of. I so, don't know. The, so, the Methodists switched to grape juice. The Welch's, Welch's grape juice is by a Methodist family. Yeah. And they did it because they had a lot of people coming to their meetings with alcohol addictions. During the prohibition, and, yeah. And, um, or pre-prohibition, right? Yeah, it was pre-prohibition. It was 1800. Right, but right, right. No, yeah. I think that wasn't the reason. The okay. reason was you had alcohol addicts coming to their meetings, and the Methodists very frequently per took communion. It was part of John Wesley's Holy Cups. Like, we're going to take this at least weekly. They actually, in some areas, started doing these round-robin uh, circuit meetings where they would do these kind of build up to this Eucharist or uh, Lord's Supper event for a whole week. They would fast. They would pray. They had meetings for, like, revival meetings every night, confessing sins, preaching hard and repentance, uh, um, uh, confessing your sins um, to in, in these small groups. Um, and then in having preaching on the cross of Christ, and it would culminate on Sunday to receiving the Lord's Supper. And I mean, during some of these meetings, people were saying that they were with their eyes or in a vision, whether in an imaginary vision, some within a physical with their corporeal eyes, um, that they were seeing the body and blood of Christ during the Lord's Supper. I mean, so this is like some wild stuff going on. 
However, with the frequency of it, you got folks with alcohol addictions here. They're like, we're going to, for the sake of not making it hard on these guys, we're going to turn this into grape juice. We're going to use grape juice instead. Which, um, I mean, at the time, mm-hmm. anyway, there's there, there's so much there. But but that, that, that is important to know um, mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. for 1,800 years, yeah. those were the elements that were being used. Right, 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 right. right. Okay. Now, it was always watered. They usually put water and wine in there. Okay. Um, they mixed it with water, so it was very watered down. Okay. <laughs> um, but it was wine, for sure. Um, so, Calvin, Christ's body and blood is truly present, but not in a corporeal way. So this, again, this is still, this bread and this wine, these are these are symbols, but we when we eat the bread, when we drink the cup, we truly receive Christ's true body and blood in a spiritual manner. The Holy Spirit, in a supernatural way, communicates to us the true body and blood of Christ that is now in heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a spiritual feeding that it strengthens and establishes us in faith, that we grow in faith, hope, and love by receiving of the sacrament, um, and uh, um, that it, it, it does something for, for Calvin. Right. Um, and that will be a uh, majority kind of reform view, the spiritual mm-hmm presence um, of a uh, so john calvin leads the reformers shocker yeah so that that's pretty much my view on communion Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um one thing i always struggle though to understand or explain is that like is in what sense is christ more present than when the saints are all gathered anyway and worshiping the lord and two or more are gathered in my name and i'm there i mean jesus is present but I think what you hit on just now is that means of grace element yes. that uh, I still feel like it's a little too mysterious to like really uh, dot every I and cross every T on it. But the way I just say it is Christ is present with us in a special way, imparting to us grace mm-hmm. for endurance for the next week. Right. That's how I kind of understand it. And, and I see like in First Corinthians 10, this uh, typologically speaking, where the Apostle Paul talks about how they ate uh, spiritual food and drank spiritual drink in right. the wandering of the wilderness. Right, right, right. This typologically prefigures our partaking of the holy food and drink Absolutely. and communion. So I understand it is just as it sustained them physically, there's a sustenance for us spiritually. Yes. And so. That's how I understand it, that there's something real happening over against the Zwinglian view. Right, right. Um, but I can't go all the way to, to Luther and to personally. Well, I mean... Right. Although I wouldn't criticize someone for that. Um, I have a problem me. with the fact that people are taking communion and dying in 1 Corinthians 11, right? They're That's falling okay. asleep. <laughs> I know, me too. I no, was like... I mean, <laughs> I mean, a guy stroked out in Michael's church like, recently, but he didn't die. Dude, co- uh, that actually happened. <laughs> um, I was in the wow. service, and the Dude, guy behind it's us... It's a wild story. Wild thing. Yeah, anyway. A, no, it's, it's, it's a can I tell that? It's 51 that's... minutes. We got like six minutes. Okay, dude, before we're done. I'm so, done. It's <laughs> <a> so, <laughs> yeah, so, but people are dying. And this, is, this is why, for me, I can't go... I, I, I don't... I can't hold to the Roman Catholic view right um it all it all comes down to what's the definition of is is like wait, what's what's the meaning of this is my body <laughs> this and this is, is my, yeah lots yeah, of ink spilled over those two words <laughs> exactly so so but but with the the idea that people have died from taking communion like that's like Uzzah touches the ark in an unworthy manner right and dies right, right right the ark wasn't just a box made of wood that crushed the guy right like it was something holy and there was something present there that struck him dead, right? Right. So they're taking communion in a way that they're getting drunk. They're 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 practicing communion in a way that they're they're over overlooking the poor and favoring the rich, right? Uh, and and they're carrying the ark. They're carrying God's presence in a way that killed folk, yeah. right? So for me, when I when I look at the Zwinglian argument, people are like, okay, what what's like the argument against Zwinglianism? For for me, it's it's not mysticalness it's like a verse where a guy died and it, he said some of you it sounds like it was more than one guy <laughs> like how many times do people have to die before you go let's not right, get drunk right. on communion right and i think paul i mean he he said this is why there's there's I, I'm paraphrasing the sick and dying among you so it's a little unclear if he means like these people are dropping dead at the lord's table or 
there's just a prevalence of of death and sickness in their yeah. community. That's how I um, took it, and that's that that that's how I took it. However, in the third century, you have a man named Cyprian of Carthage, and you had people that the Roman government was requiring sacrifice to the Roman and pagan gods, and a lot of Christians did it. They went and they just offered those sacrifices. And Cyprian said they cannot be readmitted to the Lord's table until they go through some intense repentance. Like in the beginning, he's like for life, for their good. you know. But he, but he toned down after a while after some other bishops <laughs> kind of reined him in a little bit. And he chill. Was, yeah, chill, chill. Um, but one of his arguments is saying why he took that so seriously. Like, no, some kind of repentance has to be done if you have committed apostasy and sacrifice to a demon god, and then you come before the Lord's table. He says, "We have had. I will give you eyewitness accounts of people dying at the Lord's table and getting possessed by demons and dying there on the spot." And he says. It's not happening to everybody, but what's happening to a few is a warning to us all. So we got and first so this is and so you Cyprian. read that. So I, I'm and, well, I, I'm just I'm an historian. I'm I'm like you're I'm about reading. To die and you're gonna like have to deal with like demons for fifteen. Oh my minutes gosh! You know I'm I'm just I plead innocence as the church that just loves church history and just like oh Cyprian who's this and I read and I come upon the page where he's talking That's about this. Nuts. I'm like, what do I do with this? How do I fit this into my put in your dissertation? Lord, Lord, Cyprian. Theology. It will probably appear there in some way. <laughs> um, it did appear in a paper I presented uh, two okay. years ago. So, okay, Michael, you can tell your seizure story. Uh, sure. It, it wasn't a seizure. It was. Uh, we were holding a church service. At the very end of it, there was uh, a guy who. Um, so we're taking communion, and it's like, I I think we were in between the bread and the cup, and in between it, we're about to take it. I'm like holding up the cup, and um, and. I, and as I say this, there's there's a woman raising her hand in church, and she's like, "Excuse me, excuse me, my husband passed out, and wow. like he's he's over like this." Um, I call for any doctors in the room or anybody of that nature to uh, to please come help. They lay him out on the ground. So this is like in church. Uh, he's on the ground. He's passed out. I'm just like, this is real time. I don't know if he's alive or not. I don't know what happened. And um, I say, let's pray. We pray. And he's down there and there's people, you know, checking pulse and, and all of this. And, um, and so as we're standing there, I'm just reminded of Acts chapter 20 and, uh, and Acts 20, Paul's in Troas. And uh, it's where Eutychus falls and dies during a church meeting. Wow. And if you really read it closely, what you see is that Paul stops to take communion while Eutychus is dead. Oh, wow. And that's that. and my understanding of it is this is actually like part of the miracle is that as they're celebrating the life and presence of Jesus, life comes back to Eutychus. That's incredible. Now, and, uh, and I read some scholarly work on that, and it in the English it's not especially clear that that's what's happening, but it you can see it-ish. Mm-hmm. It took a few Greek scholars to help me see it. But anyway, I'm uh-huh. just saying, I've preached through it before, so I saw it. And uh, anyway, so I thought of that, and I thought, what a mockery of the devil to uh, to have somebody die during a celebration of the life of Jesus. And so I just said, you know what? I said something to that effect. I reminded them of that story. And I said, let's... Uh, and, and there was nothing for anyone else to do except sit there and wait and, like, what are we going to do? And I said, let's... Uh, People around them are medical professionals are are taking care of this the best they can, and um, uh, and nine one one had been called. I said, "You call nine one one." I said that to somebody, so ambulance was on their way. Uh, and I said, "In the meantime, let's finish taking communion, celebrate the life of Jesus together." Uh, we took communion uh, together. Within a few moments of that, um, he came to, and. Um, and so, uh, wow. long story short, he found out that day that he had had stage four cancer, and uh, stage four. I want to say it was stomach cancer. I can't remember, uh, but uh, anyway, it was stage four. Um, that was just a few months ago. Uh, he got the death sentence. They said you're going to die. Um, he is alive today with zero cancer at all. Come on, Jesus. Um, That's awesome. So, now, I, I will say they did still give him chemo, so I, I don't want to, like, I'll, I'll be honest about, like, the mm-hmm. fullness of it. Right. Uh, but I will also say no doctor expected that, and that's completely uh, uncharacteristic. That's One, for, I mean, the likelihood was death. 
uh, but but two, that life and full life and full no cancer to happen this quickly was absolutely astounding and unheard of. That's incredible. Which is, that's I mean, awesome. and again, that's that's why it's again just it, worth plugging the charismatic bit. Like, take medicine. We're totally down with the of medicine. course. We had with the physicians, we had doctors, and the yeah. ambulance, all of that. Absolutely. And they still, they took them in that stuff. day, absolutely. checked them out, yeah. all of that. Uh, but also, I think for me and for us, what it illustrates is there really is power in communion. This isn't just remembering. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, okay, so I'm, I'm making a case that I don't think it's Zwinglian is the view, okay? I guess if that hadn't already come out. <laughs> um, right. There's real life resurrection power of Jesus. This is a real means of grace, and I think Jesus looked down on that and he honored it. I think so too, and I think um, I my, my view, I feel like some days I'm more... Calvin, some days I'm more Luther. I mean, I want to take the word as it says. This is yeah. my body, this is my blood. Um, in practice, like, you know, if someone drops it on the ground, like, am I going to tear it up and burn it? I'm not. I'm not gonna Luther in that ground. sense. But I, 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 what I love about Calvin's view is that, is that you have the Holy Spirit is communicating in some supernatural way the body and blood in Christ of Christ to us through this sacrament. And I think that's probably where I land most um and i love i love the anglican methodist uh means of grace that this is this is an instrument a vehicle of god imparting grace and strengthening our our hearts in the lord and actually i, I think this is worth saying too is that um whatever we land on on communion i think um i think as believers in christ um we've we're joined to christ but is that should give us confidence to come to the lord's table mm. um now i believe in confession of sin i believe in you know, this is why Augustine says this. He says the, it is important to come with a clean heart, but that's why in, in the early church they prayed the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Yeah. And you can have confidence that God answers that prayer and that you can worthily receive of the Holy Communion. And and you can and so for people that are sick, I tell them, take communion. Take communion regularly. I give them the I give I I've actually made a little script, you know, that has the Lord's words there that it's it it our view of communion, I don't think, should cause us to cower from communion. I, I've got too much sin. I, 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 I'm, I'm not worthy. If you're unworthy, confess your sins, and he who is faithful and just will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And some, while taking communion, will get convicted of sin, and actually that will become an opportunity to repent. Um, so I just let be drawn to the Lord's presence. This, is, mm-hmm. this sacrament is an invitation for, to dine with Jesus, to commune with Jesus. It is a communion with his body and blood, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 11, 24, I think. Um, um, and I just, beloved, so, take advantage of that. There's so many mm-hmm. things that mm-hmm. we haven't addressed in this episode, mm-hmm. right? We haven't addressed, can you take a communion at home? We haven't addressed, uh, when does the communion become communion in a non-Roman Catholic view, right? We got the hocus pocus from the the Latin phrase that sounds like... Hocus corpus meum. Mm-hmm. That, we, that mm-hmm. Luther would mock as hocus, hocus. pocus, or the, the Zwinglians, the Zwinglians mm-hmm. were the ones who mm-hmm. made the big deal about it. Uh, but but there are still, uh, in many Protestant traditions, a bit of, a, of an institution where it passes from being bread and juice or wine into being now they're the sacraments we haven't touched on that absolutely we haven't touched on uh, i mean there's just so many sacramental questions uh so many uh yeah sacramental questions that we haven't answered that we might have to have you back on uh to discuss in the future that's my way of uh volunteering him back (laughs) we've the Uh, best way to volunteer someone back on the show is is on air yeah there you go there you go we'd love to have you back sometime Uh, matthew i'd love to come i'd love to come (laughs) excellent (laughs) Love this uh, topic. Just while you're writing your dissertation, that would be great. Oh, gosh. Um, anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. We've got a lot of exciting episodes coming down the pipe. Let's see if we can display those. Uh, really great episodes tomorrow, as you can see just up in the corner. Uh, we are going to be discussing revival culture tomorrow. Uh, Michael Miller and Michael Roundtree, myself, we're going to be discussing that. We've got an episode with Doug Wilson. We're going to discuss theonomy and just war theory. Uh, we've got Jordan Cooper from Skillet coming on. Uh, then we're going to be doing another episode where we're, we're discussing uh, the kind of the protocols. How, how do we 
how do we practice healing in our churches and our home groups and our local settings? What would be healthy practices in practicing uh, the gift of the Spirit, in, in particular the gift of healing? Uh, after that, we've got an episode on cessationism with Tom Schreiner and Lori Craig discussing uh, with us uh, uh, the LGBTQ questions. It's going to be really interesting. I hope you guys uh, liked this episode and will continue to subscribe, like the videos so you get notified when we come out with other videos just like this. Uh, that is all. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you're blessed by it, man, please consider donating. Uh, you know, we've got some links in the descriptions. You can give on PayPal there or Patreon. Uh, PayPal, you can do a one-time gift or Patreon. It'd be a, a weekly gift or monthly gift, sorry, uh, as low as five bucks a month. Anyway, uh, blessings, guys. We will see you next time, which is tomorrow. Peace.